Welcome back to State of the Nation, live from the Frodingham Community Centre in Scunthorpe. We've been discussing the effects of the net zero agenda on the cost of energy and how this poses serious risks to steel jobs in this area. But now we're going to move on to perhaps the second most important subject to this audience at least, immigration, both legal and illegal. This week we have seen the House of Lords debating the safety of Rwanda bill and it's clear that there is an agenda in the upper house to try and delay the plan. But while the Rwanda plan may not be perfect, there seems to be no viable alternative. Meanwhile, on the question of legal migration, we've seen the Office for National Statistics release its latest projections for the UK population growth, with revive estimates suggesting that the UK will reach 70 million people by 2026, mainly owing to immigration. Well, with me now is my most intellectual panel, the economist and uh, fellow at the Centre for Brexit Policy, Catherine McBride, and GB News senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. And once again, we're going to questions from the audience, and I think Ron Gilliard has a question for us. Ron. Evening, Jacob. Mine's a bit of a cliché question, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. What can be done to stop the boats, and when? Well, it's a very important question. Other countries have done it, or Australia particularly managed to do it, and it did a version of Rwanda. And that's why I've always thought Rwanda is the right way to go. It's the one thing that would act as a real deterrent because people crossing the channel don't want to go to Rwanda. That's not that Rwanda isn't safe, but they're trying to get to the UK, not to Rwanda. Um, and that it's a way of deterring them and stopping this illegal trade that is leading to people dying in the channel. So I think it's the only viable option. We can't turn the boats round as they did in Australia because there's no international water between us and the, and the French and we can't invade Calais, but that made a rather aggressive policy. Um, Nigel? Uh, I just don't, I don't think Rwanda works. That um, on the basis that you're talking about one in a hundred people would probably end up there under the present plans. So it doesn't become much of a deterrent. When it comes to Ron's question about how do you stop the boat, well, the chances are we won't stop them for quite some time. However, um, if only we would actually look a bit more long term. So, for instance, we change the asylum system. At the moment, you have a system whereby you can only claim asylum in Britain if you're on British soil. If we could find a way of, of uh, changing that, that would deter people from crossing the channel, but there'd be no, be no point. So, for instance, Labour have got an idea uh, in their five-point immigration plan, which would be to um, have settlement schemes whereby people with connections to the UK could apply for asylum somewhere else, say a refugee camp or something like that. That doesn't mean they'd all get it. The, the rules would be exactly the same as they are now, but it would take away the pull the channel has got. Catherine. Um, I would say that the Australian system would work for us, but there, it was more complicated than just taking people to another location. First of all, they made it easy for people to apply, and they could only apply from embassies outside of Australia. So they did reverse that um, policy. They also put up a lot of notices in all of the places where the boats left explaining this in every language possible of this is how you apply to get to Australia. So you didn't get taken straight to Nauru. But they did know that everyone they were taking to Nauru Island was definitely not a proper asylum seeker. But the UK does bring in a lot of asylum seekers who've come from eligible places like Hong Kong, Ukraine and Afghanistan and they did that outside of the UK. So you don't have to be... We're, yeah. We've got another question from Clive Pemberton. Clive, do you want to fire away at us? <laughs> Evening, Jacob. Um, was it a mistake by Richard Sunak to sack Suella Braverman? Well, Catherine, I didn't give you much chance to answer last time, so what do you think about that? Well, I think it was a mistake for him to agree with her, with the whole legal list, he should have known she was a lawyer, um, that he would um, support her, um, her immigration plan and then to renege on that. I think that was his big mistake. After doing that, it doesn't really matter. If he, if he didn't sack her, she would have left, I think. But, um, but I think that was the thing that is most shocking, that she'd actually supported his legal, uh, leadership bid by agreeing 
between the two of them that this is what he would do, and then he reneged on it. Nigel? Yeah, I just think that in this, in this particular case, that um, she was using a lot of inappropriate language, but the, the straw that broke the camel's back was to write an article criticising the police for double standards because she was saying they weren't uh, policing protests properly, hitting hard on the right wing, not hitting hard on Palestinian protesters. That was in direct contravention to orders from Number 10. And quite simply, like any boss, Rishi Sunak was left within, with uh, no alternative but to fire her. So that's the reason she got sacked. But the one thing I would add is that had Suella backed Boris the year before, Boris would have come back as Prime Minister. Her support for Rishi was absolutely fundamental. Um, Steve Moore, do you want to send your question winging its way to us? Winged words. Good evening, Jacob. Uh, do the population uh, projections from this week that the UK could reach 70 million people by 2026 suggest that the Conservatives have betrayed their voters? Well, I think betray is a very strong word, but I think migration, legal migration, has been much too high and that in a way we've been distracted by illegal migration. If you think in the two years to June of 2023, 1.4 million people net entered this country. That's against 40,000 who came in illegally in each year, so 80-odd thousand altogether. That's a much bigger number, and the 70 million is, to my mind, unsustainable. We cannot get there unless we have lots of other policy changes on houses and road building and hospitals and so on. But Nigel... Uh, I would like, like immigration not to be a numbers game. Yeah, I think that figure's horrific. Um, it's, it sounds, when it, when it comes to, <laughs> to 70 million, that's, that seems an incredible amount. Um, but the, the whole point is that legal migration, as opposed to illegal, has got to be based on the needs of the British economy. So, for instance, uh, we've got 150,000 vacancies in the care sector, 120,000 vacancies in the NHS, that we just can't fill. So if you're bringing people in to do those specific jobs, that's fine. Yes, let's try and get British people to do those jobs. It'll help um, that no longer can bosses bring in people for 80% of a, a British wage. Now they have to pay the full amount. Good. But let um, Catherine get a word in there. Yes, Catherine. Yeah, well, I think that, that you've just hit the nail on the head. I mean, they, this has been a policy of lowering wages. This is not a policy. This is bringing in workers for 80% of what a British person would pay. And when you say, oh, we can't get people to do those jobs, no, what you mean is you can't get it to do those jobs at that price. If you doubled the wages, they would do those jobs. And that is the key thing, and that, I think, is where it's a problem. I mean, a good two-thirds of the people who are coming in are either students who are paying a small fortune to get a degree without the pre prerequisite um, uh, uh, A-levels, we've discovered. Um, and that's bringing money into yeah. the country. But it's the, the, what they're doing to the wages is terrible. Well, I completely agree with that. Thank you, um, everyone. And to my panel, to Nigel and Catherine. Um, Nigel is the most civilised socialist we ever come across. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to have him join me every week.